this is Janet Diane Morris Wordlow with another edition of our latest Expansions News Podcast. And of course, sitting here beside me, direct from New York City, is Stuart Ace Wordlow. Hello, everybody. How are you today? Well, Stuart, it's so nice of you to join us via satellite. Oh, yes, you can see what's over my head. I connect directly to the Lion Frequency, God Mind Frequency, and here I am. Isn't it amazing? Yes, you are much more amazing than people even tell you that you are. I am just so impressed. Well, thank you. Now, if I could only figure out how to make my eyes and my mouth move, I would be good. But please, don't look too closely because I have very strange words and symbols shaved into my beard today. Oh, okay, well maybe that's what I see emanating all around you. Possibly. I can't tell because I cannot move my eyes. Alright, Stuart, you just be quiet for a minute now while I go ahead and tell these good people what's going on in the world today because I don't want you to use too much of your energy. Thank you, Janet. You are so much better than I and so much prettier than I, too. Why didn't I realize that before? Oh, well, thank you, Stuart. I'm so happy to hear you've finally admitted that. Alright, now... The very interesting information from space, which Stuart may already know because he's doing his instant satellite transmission or whatever he's doing over there. It says that scientists say that there is a nearby planet that might be the oldest capable of supporting alien life. Now this newfound exoplanet candidate called Captain B, which lies a mere 13 light years away, is about 11.5 billion years old, which makes it 2.5 times older than the Earth and just 2 billion years or so younger than the universe itself. Now, here we go. This is by a quote by the lead author of the study, Gilliam Anglada Esquade of Queen Mary University of London says, quote, it does make you wonder what kind of life could have evolved on those planets over such a long time." Unquote. Why are they bringing this up? They're telling you right here that they, there might be life out there. So you want to be sure and keep your eyes and ears open because they're continuing to tell you about the possibilities of alien life. Now we all know Stuart recently returned from Japan. And what have we got going on out there? We've got the Godzilla movie that was just released. Now we have astronomers discovering a mega Earth exoplanet, another one, calling it the Godzilla of Earths. So Godzilla's got to be a trigger out there for you, so be sure you use your brown merger symbol because uh, you just don't know what's going to happen anymore. In fact, I was reading about a zookeeper who shot a um, zoo employee in a gorilla suit with a a uh, tranquilizer gun and put him in very serious conditions, so perhaps he had Godzilla programming. Anyway, this mega Earth is several times, uh, let's see, the mega Earth, as it has been dubbed, shares some, several similarities with our planet, possibly including the potential to support life. Again, more potential to support life. This is the Godzilla of Earth. This is a quote. Dimitar Seselov, an astronomer at the Center and director of the Harvard Origins of Life Initiative, said in a written statement, but unlike the movie monster, Kepler-10c has positive implications for life. Now, what makes the planet so special is its mass, because so far, far scientists have previously thought that massive planets could not exist unless they were composed of hydrogen and gas, much like Jupiter and other so-called gas giants. So this is paving the way to let you know that large planets are not just hydrogen and gas, but perhaps something more. Now they also tell you, this is again another interesting statement, this gentleman continues on quoting him saying, Finding Kepler-10c tells us that rocky planets could form much earlier than we thought, and if you can make rocks, you can make life. Now, usually we're taught in conventional education that rocks are inanimate objects. So, how can we go from making rocks to making life? Well, listen on because I've got more interesting space type news this week for you. Now, some of you may have watched the movie Lord of the Rings and in it they had the Eye of Sauron. Well, now they're saying the Eye of Sauron was spotted by a new plant, planet hunter. And they're saying in the article, it looks a little bloodshot, ha ha. This person, uh, let me find his name here. We've got the name. Jean-Luc Bezouet said in a written statement that this is just the beginning. 
because there is a new instrument that was installed by the European Space Observatory last month on its very large telescope in Chile. Now I want you to understand what's going on here. This is the European Space Observatory, but their very large telescope is in Chile. They have installed this thing called the SPHERE, which stands for Spectropolarimetric High Contrast Exoplanet Research Instrument. They have installed this in Chile, and remember Stuart and I were recently in uh, French Guiana, and there there is a, a space launch station from Europe as well, so we've got a lot of things going on behind the scenes. This particular object, uh, instrument, called the SPHERE, shows HR 4796A, which is a young star engulfed in a dust ring, and it is located 220 light years away in the southern constellation of Centaurus. Now what's interesting is they're telling us it's almost spooky how closely it resembles that watchful great eye, Lidless, wreath, Lidless wreathed in flame, which was depicted in the Lord of the Rings. So they're bringing this up to your attention. This is now being flashed all over the internet. You want to remember that this could possibly be a trigger, much like the Godzilla thing I just told you, the Eye of Horus. So they're telling you that somebody is watching you from outer space, and it is red, and this is astral level information that's being put out there for you. So anyway, remember they're telling you this is just the beginning. Sphere is a uniquely powerful tool and will doubtless reveal many exciting surprises in the years to come. So be prepared, they are forewarning you. Now, how are we going to conquer space? Well, this I found exactly very interesting because the new buzzword out there is 3D printers. They're telling you now that they may be able to print humans in order to conquer space. Quote, our best bet for space exploration could be printing humans organically on another planet, said Adam Steltzner, lead engineer on NASA's Curiosity rover mission at a futuristic conference held this month in Washington, D.C. He goes on to say that scientists, including Stephen Hawking, believe our very survival depends on escaping our fragile planet and colonizing other planets. Now again, I want you to understand what's going on here. They're using fear. They're telling you that we need to escape our fragile planet. Well, believe you me, our planet is not fragile. Our planet has allowed us to be here, and if it doesn't want us on it, it will get rid of us. So it's not a fragile planet. And Stephen Hawking, as you know, is going to say whatever his handlers tell him to say. Now this article continues to say landing humans on other planets is no simple task. So, again, get how they're changing history. Why not just seed the galaxy with tiny organisms designed to recreate our species? And then they go on to tell you how that might work. Are they going to put it in bacteria, encode it with human DNA, store the information that's going to divide, and goes on and on and on and on, just like the human egg cell is programmed by our DNA to divide, replicate, and develop into a human, so bacteria could be programmed by our DNA to do the same thing. Really, that's like a rock to life. Now we've got bacteria to humans, and so on. Now, this continues on, and it says it's a thousand years from now, but we will be able to do it because 1,000 years is a blink in the four billion year timescape. Now, the, the lead uh, scientist continues on, and he says, if you let your mind run wild, you might even wonder whether we are the product of tiny bacteria someone else programmed to colonize the Earth. Perhaps Earth was terraformed in this way. More likely, we are a big mistake. Where have you heard that from before? Well, I think I should use a little of my energy and power and tell you, yes, I have said this many times. I believe this physical reality is a mistake in the mind of God. Really, Stuart? Yes, and I have said this, and people know this, and now it is in writing. That makes it a fact. Of course, you know that. Anything in writing must be true. Okay. Anyway, he goes on to say, and the cute little puppy dogs that should have dominated the earth have been trumped by a glitch called humans. Interesting, yes? You must listen to Stuart, because Stuart is always right. Isn't that right, Stuart? Of course I'm always right. So happy to hear you finally say that, Janet. Well, I'm only saying that publicly right now because you said I was the pretty one and I like that. Now, in a London hospital, scientists are growing body parts using stem cells. 
Now I've reported on this before, but apparently they're making it sound like it's brand new, so I'm going to just let you know what's going on there. Because again, at the bottom of this article, if you read these articles written in here, they're telling you what they're doing. So we'll start with their news, which is that scientists are growing noses, ears, and blood vessels in a laboratory in a bold attempt to make body parts using stem cells. Now, so far they're telling us they've done tear ducts, blood vessels, and windpipes, but they want to transplant larger organs such as kidney, lungs, and livers, but those are more complicated. So they're telling you that right now they want noses and ears to become more, they're saying the word right, but that's what anyway, so we'll go with that for now. But what's interesting down here is it says some scientists predicted certain lab-made organs will soon cease to be experimental. I'm convinced engineered organs are going to be on the market soon, says a professor of transplantation biology at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Now, if we go on a little bit further, listen to this one. She says, if people are not that fussy, we could manufacture different sizes of noses so the surgeon could choose a size and tailor it for patients before implanting it. People think your nose is very individual and personal, but this is something that we could mass produce like in a factory one day. Why would we want to do that? Hmm, I think this one has very interesting implications. Let me know what you think about that. Now, continuing on with the 3D theme, because again, this is the new buzzword and they're opening up that frequency for you. They're letting us know that the first 3D egg fossils of ancient flying reptiles were found in China. So, anyway, what's interesting about this one is why are they being called 3D egg fossils? Why not just a complete egg? This is what we used to be told. Now we're being told it's a 3D egg fossil. And it says that they have been unearthed, uh, that, let's see, the first three-dimensionally preserved eggs of ancient winged reptiles that lived more than 100 million years ago have been unearthed in China. So they want you to get that into your mind, 3D. Now, moving on, you, you should close your ears, Stuart. Oh, right, well, I would, but you remember I told you I can't move too much right now. Okay, well, I'll try and, you know, just kind of buffer them a bit for you. Rihanna. Rihanna goes practically naked to the cancel of of Fashion Designers Awards. Now, I've been telling you that you're going to see more nudity in public and it's going to become more acceptable. Well, here we have Rihanna, and you'll have to go to the, to the link to take a look at this, but basically she's wearing nothing but a net, and everything is showing except she has a little thong on which she covers at first with a fur, a little pink fur, and then she opens that up. To me, that's, again, uh, if you go to kitten programming, monarch programming, uh, you're going to find out that there is a lot more going on than, well, I don't know, meets the, meets the eye. In this particular instance, everything meets the eye. But basically, yes, she is naked, just a little covering in the, the front of her pubic area and barely there. Take a look at that. And then we have uh, Maria Menua, Menu, Menunos. I guess you know how that to spell. That's M-E-N-O-U-N-O-S, recalling her bikini malfunction, the most embarrassing moment of her life. Again, why do we need to know this, right? Well, I'm going to tell you why you need to know this according to the news people that are going on there. She says she came out of the water and I'm like, quote, these people are not stopping. I'm like, wow, is Britney Spears behind me? What's going on? Oh no, my vagina's out. That's it, she said. Okay, now let me tell you something. If you know anything about female anatomy, and especially if you're a woman, you should know, your fem your, if your vagina is out, you need to get yourself to a hospital. So her vagina was not out, let me tell you that right now. So anyway, again, they're putting this stuff out and people are eating it up and not thinking twice. So those of you who are studying hyperspace oversoul work, discernment is key here. Uh, women don't talk like that anyway. So it's not going to be, oh my God, my vagina is out because that's me. Let me rush to the hospital immediately. It's a medical emergency. So anyway, what's going on here? It's crazy. Now, when I was looking through some of these pictures, and I, again, I posted the link for you so you'll be able to see uh, um, the cutouts on the dresses that the women are being uh, told that they're going to wear in 2014, 2015, again, does not leave much to the imagination. 
So just because it's out there doesn't mean you have to participate in it, but do be aware of what's going on out there. Now next, somebody sent this article to me, which I thought was really good. What well, Hunger Games 2015 tour could lead, to, could lead to a theme park. Now those of you who have read the Hunger Games, which I've read that, has to do with uh, basically pitting people against each other, killing the, the team, team members off. And you'll remember when the Hunger Games first came out there, I did report to you that in elementary to middle schools, in many areas, it was required reading, which I found really astounding. And then on top of that, some teachers were actually taking their kids to see the movie. Now, I did watch the first movie, and, and I was told it wasn't that bad. Trust me, it is that bad. It's disgusting. And little kids should not be reading the book, nor should they be going to the movie. Well, of course, they have another movie that is out, the second one. I have not watched that, and I have no intentions to watching it, at least at this point. And, of course, there's a third one due out. Now, as far as this actual Hunger Games theme park, this is what's interesting. Because this exhibition about the Hunger Games, because they're pushing that, there's a reason, it's going to be featured in major museums and institutions across the U.S. It's going to include interactive displays with costumes, props, and other elements found in the world depicted, and it's calling it the Blockbuster Franchise. I don't know about that. It will incorporate artifacts featured in the first three films from locations within the capital and the various districts of Panem, that's how I say it. I don't know how they say it. Now, the studio announced that Jennifer Brown, Brown, think about that, bringing it into the present, Brown, if you know your color codes, of the Think Well group, which of course I've never heard of, maybe you have, has been brought on board to oversee the launch of the U.S. tour and to explore additional theme park attraction and other location-based entertainment opportunities around the world. The tour will then travel the country several months ahead of the November 20th, 2015 worldwide release of the fourth film, The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2. Now, again, you want to think about what's going on here, what they're imprinting people with, and if it's at museums and institutions, they're going to go, and it's going to make things like this acceptable. Humans hunting other humans purely for entertainment. Plus, if you look at that Hunger Games book and you read it, the way that I've been teaching you and talking to you about all these months about the news and the podcast, the people in the capital are, are dressing like animals, they're being different colors, all different things that I've been talking to you about. This is what they're imprinting now the people with through this movie. If you haven't read the book, read it just so you understand what's going on. Okay, moving right along to Truvia. Truvia is a sweetener, which some of you may have on your shelves. If you do, throw it away. I would have told you this a long time ago, but now here's uh, some proof to throw it away. It says that it's actually a powerful pesticide that scientists were shocked to find that fruit flies died in less than a week from eating GMO-derived erythritol. Now, I have never been fond of erythritol, and I have mentioned Dr. Mercola's book, where he, expo uh, Sweet Deceptions, I believe it's called, where he talks about the different sweeteners that are out there, and his research is excellent, and I've never been a fan of it. I liked what he said in his research. Now they're telling you that uh, this Truvia, which is an alternative sweetener manufactured by the food giant Cargill, is a potent insecticide that kills fruit flies which consume it. So anyway, get rid of everything in your house with erythritol. Let's see, now what they're saying is that it's, it's uh, made from yeast-fed genetically modified corn derivatives and that's why it's being labeled natural. But instead it says it's being fed genetically modified corn maltodextrin. So, read the link. Apple iPhone. Now they are going to have a new app out which is going to allow you to measure your blood pressure, your weight, your sleep, hydration, and blood sugar. So you're going to watch for this to come out. It says others that are going to happen, activity rates, uh, respiratory rate, hydration levels, which I just said. And they're also going to have something called behavioral change on the app. It's going to be called MAT, which is short for Motivation, Ability, and Triggers. I wonder why that's coming into play. Anyway, watch for this new app called Health Kit. And they're not telling us when it's going to come out, just that it is in the works. Now, speaking of technology, 
All of you, of course, are watching what's happening with Google Glass as it's slowly beginning to infiltrate through our societies. This article is interesting because they are now calling it wearable intelligence. And who's wearing it? Well, the doctors at Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Massachusetts as part of a pilot program at hospitals across the nation. Because, as you know, if doctors wear it, then that makes it okay, right? Because they're going to show you the positive things for it. They're not going to tell you the rest of it. So again, just keep your mind open. And this particular article talks about a doctor saving life because he has Google Glass and he can go quickly from one place to another to get records and information and other doctors and bingo, 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 you are saved. So, wearable intelligence, keep that term in mind. Now again, Stuart, I want you to participate here because here you were right. Oh, yes, I'm always right, Janet. Yes, I know, you tell us. We have new research that links marijuana to sperm abnormalities. This is a new study by scientists at the University of Sheffield which links marijuana to use to sperm abnormalities that could limit men's fertility. I have been telling people this for years and years. I know you have, my dear. And now you are being vindicated because it's in writing. If it's in writing, it's true. Of course, we'll just read my books. It's in writing there. And come to my seminars and events because I tell you the truth the way it is. Yes, I know you do, Stuart. Thank you so much for being out there and putting yourself out there for people. So, anyway, I want to bring that to the forefront because a lot of times, and just so you know, uh, Stuart will have consultations with people and tell them what's going on and pretty soon they're coming back to him and saying you were right. That's right. Now if you would just say you're right more often, Janet, I would be so much happier. I know, my dear, but sometimes I'm more right than you. Uh-oh. You ran out of energy. I see you can't respond. Okay. Now this one is actually a very good article which I put in specifically for Stuart, so I hope he gets his energy back soon. This one is about a college turning cow poop into clean water, which could be great for the environment, it says. Yes, that's right, cow poop into water. Can, do you have your energy back yet? No response. I've got to go on without him, I guess. It says that a cow produces approximately 10,000 gallons of manure each year. Michigan State University in East Lansing, Michigan, of course, because it's Michigan State University, says that 90% of the manure produced is water. So they have got a nutrient separation system project that began about a decade ago at MSU where they're separating out the water from everything else. They're saying that they can glean 50 gallons of clean water from 100 gallons of manure. However, they're working to increase the collection to 65 gallons of water which means the average farm, listen to this, accumulates 1,790,000 gallons of manure annually, and that could be producing nearly 900,000 gallons of clean water or more. And this would be very important, especially in the West where water is at a premium. Oh, I think Stuart's coming back to life. Here it comes. Uh, energy's coming back through me again. I can feel it through my head. Now I want you to notice all these interesting symbols at the top. They're feeding it right in directly into my brain. Oh, out of energy. Okay, I thought you would be. So, that's what I have to tell you today. Lots of interesting things going on in the world. And I want you to be aware. Now, I'm, what I'm telling you here on our podcast is kind of a big chunk of information. When you come to our seminars and events, we make all of this information personal to you, believe it or not. For example, we're talking a lot about growing organs from stem cells, but what makes those organs fail in the first place? Do you know if you get a new heart or you get a new lung or you get a new kidney, what does that mean? Does that mean that it's going to be sustained or do you know the mind pattern behind what's going on? Do you know the fine nuances of what's happening to you in your life? Well, Stuart and I happen to be able to look at you and help you find out what's when you, what is within your own mind pattern so you can make discernment choices and choices that will correct what's going on in your life to make everything better for you, your health, your relationships, your career, your financial picture. So there's a lot of things that are happening here at Expansions.com that we want you to be aware of. Our next event is in August, communication. 
You want to be able to communicate with yourself, with your oversoul, with God mind. You want to be able to communicate with your colleagues, your co-workers, your neighbors, everybody out there, even the person at the grocery store, because there is something out there that they are trying to tell you, and we want you to learn how to interpret that correctly. We will be working with color, tone, and archetype, and we also have some very special days with Stuart's lined up for the summer where you will be working with salt water meditations and visualizations. Dolphin frequency, sea serpent frequency, and other frequencies that are specifically unique to you. So if you want a day with Stuart, if you're interested in the August communication seminar, now's the time to act because these days and the seminar, of course, is limited. And in October, everything oversold. So everything you wanted to know about your oversold, we're going to be discussing. That's going to be a phenomenal seminar. People are already signing up for both, and you do not want to miss out on these. And finally, we are having specialty workshops and seminars custom designed for you. That's right. You can tell us when you want to be here and what subjects you want to learn. You can even grab a friend or two and bring them right along with you, and we will custom design a day or two, a week, however long you want to spend here but we do have to put time out on our calendar. So again, if you're interested, you need to contact Patricia, customer support at expansions.com as soon as possible so that she can help you make these plans for you. So whatever your dreams are, we can help you figure out how to make them come true. You are connected to the greatest strength that exists. No technology can surpass that. Nothing can surpass what is within you and the power of your own mind. Look what Stuart can do with the power of his mind. He can communicate with us from New York City. Isn't that right, Stuart? Yes, that's right. I have all my channels open and flowing. I am connected to my oversoul and God mind. The energy is flowing clean and clear. And you know what? I still can't move my ears and my mouth and my eyes yet. But I'm working on that, perhaps by next time. Yes, Stuart, I know you work very hard on everything. I'm very proud of you. Thank you so much for being a part of my life. And you know what? Father's Day is right around the corner. I appreciate the fact that we have beautiful children and we have a beautiful life and everything you have done. And I appreciate especially the fact that you told me I'm the pretty one. Well, Janet, I have to say nice things once in a while. You know how it goes. But I'm so happy to be here and be a part of your life and be able to share what I know with all of you out there. Thank you for joining us. That is Stuart, directly and alive from New York City, and myself, Janet Diane Morris-Wordlaw from St. Joseph, Michigan. Bye-bye now.